Welcome all, slightly later than planned, but that's the problems that happened to me in real life. Apologies for that, but ahead of my full review, I wanted to cover what I feel is the most poignant question on the lips of current and potentially new Xbox One owners, and Microsoft's first major revamp of the hardware. That being, does it perform better than the current machine? Anyone who follows me on Twitter will know that I tweeted at the time with my suspicions that this was the case with the upclock and improvement due to the new manufacturing process. Well, the answer is not as black and white as you may want, or like, but as E.L. James proved, shades of grey can be loved even more. A quick history lesson is this is not new. Major updates, revamps and brand new hardware manufacturing processes are not new to this generation or any other, including software limiters to keep models within a finite performance base, easy for developers and owners alike. I've covered more in my what is software and new console prediction videos if you are so inclined. But with the S, we have the first time enhancements that you could class as substantial over its base model. Now other models and releases have taken them away before mind. Now this all stems from the paradigm shift this generation took at the start, covered in my What Is Consoles article, allowing the now migrated base architecture and hypervisor construction to control the abstraction layer. And as we gear up for the new tiered console market, the S is the pioneer of that, covered in more detail in the review and on the site. Contained in its arsenal is a 4K upscaler, full compatibility with the latest HDR displays aside the 12-bit Dolby Digital, learn more about that in my HDR article, from streaming formats to its Trojan horse, the cheapest UHD Blu-ray player on the market, open up the best entry into this new ultra movie experience. All this in a much smaller unit and no ugly external PSU, making it fit in more places and look more attractive in its black and white design. Moving from the old 28 nanometer planar construction to the new 16 nanometer FinFET has opened up the potential for a smaller, more efficient, cheaper, and yet more powerful machine. Nothing new here. But unlike before, we are given a taste of this extra power in the form of a 7% upclock to the GPU portion of the SOC from 853 MHz to 914, which in turn affects the SRAM bandwidth, moving us from 204GB per second to 219. The CPU side has not seen any increase, remaining static at 1.75GHz with assumed identical Jaguar cores. So what does this mean in practice, and more importantly in play? On paper at least, the console could see gains in any and all GPU-bound scenarios, so imagine dense alpha sequences. In CPU scenarios, it should be identical, although it has not been confirmed, as far as I am aware at least, that the DDR3 is of the same speed or bandwidth here, but most likely it is. But from tests so far on identical SSDs, yields minor to no gains, and that means that they are, or they're gated the same. So to the numbers and the games, which you can view throughout this video, that I've chosen to cover the best areas of both GPU and CPU, and remove the I.O. section of the hard drive to give a transparent as possible test. Is it a whitewash for the new machine, or a blackout? First up, we take a game that never got that much love from launch. Mirror's Edge had a good mix of CPU and GPU, along with streaming from its large open cityscape, sporting a dynamic resolution update, but mostly sticking to the Frostbite engine standard for 60Hz games on the Xbox hardware of 720p is the majority of what we see. I have not had a chance to test thoroughly if the S improves or reduces the scaling in titles like this or Halo 5 or The Division, but I will update soon when I have more time. For now, in light for our like examples on the Xbox One and the new S here, it is almost identical in performance to the base model. Not a good start, but hardly a revelation. But can it achieve more? Well, this time we wheel out a real GPU-centric title in Final Fantasy XV, the Platinum demo from last year. Using a fixed and 100% like-for-like real-time cutscene, we actually get the best boost yet, at its height, 10% better on the S. This means we get less dips on the new machine, and at some points a locked 30, with the standard machine being 2 or 3 FPS lower. Now it does not stop all the dips mine, but it is clear that we have higher lows and a more consistent 33 millisecond rate here. Now small gameplay shows the same minor boost, giving us a mean difference of 6%. Would you look at that, nearly identical to the on paper calculation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Battlefront again shows the same as our previous Frostbite title, with the newer machine putting in an identical 60Hz run across single player action, just proving this game is rarely GPU bound, even when it looks as good as this. Now the 720p resolution helps keep the action within the standard GPU budget, and there's no benefit to be gained from this title at all. Between the S and the Xbox One base, there is no difference at all. But Rise of the Tomb Raider again can see the same 6% gain over the stock model. Using a fixed cinematic and tress effects filling the screen, we can have a locked 30 on the S with a 28 and 29 on the standard machine. Now later these dips do arrive, but again are reduced over the older machine, seeing a 3 to 4% gain overall. But as we already know, the CPU side should be no different. And for a true CPU test, we need to wheel out the big guns. Oh God, Laura, no. This is madness. Get your life sorted. Go home to the manor. You know I can't go back there. But this obsession ruined your father. I saw something. Something I... I can't explain. Rico is here with the chaotic, in more ways than were intended, Just Cause 3 that I covered first before launch with its woeful performance from horrendous frame rate issues, long loading times, slowdown and memory leaks that I highlighted all in my first contact video did receive patches from the team highlighting these issues as real. Sadly, the patches never improved it, but can the Xbox One save the day? <laughs> No, it still is inconsistent as before, with the game very easily dropping into the teens under action. In some ways, it can even feel worse. And here we see no tangible gains across both machines, and as such, a clear indication that the CPU is indeed identically endowed if any had doubts. Now to cement this, we need to use another CPU consumer in CD Projekt Red's magnum opus, The Witcher 3. Using the dense Novigrad test I always use, we can actually see some gains here with a locked 30 over the base model. Remember, this is identical hard drives and installs, though no more than 3% at its highest point here. And later on, we do get the same dips to 26 when heavier streaming happens, leaving us closer, but still ever so slightly ahead on the S, showing the better GPU does help ever so slightly here, if not resolve the issue overall. But I will return to this more thoroughly. So what about backwards compatibility titles then? Well, none raised up so high and fell so far as the mighty reach falls, a poetic scenario some may say. Now suffering up on the Xbox One with both dips under 30 hertz and more distractingly persistent frame pacing issues, exasperated by the triple buffer display, causing early flips into the 16 millisecond range and the removal of any tearing which is always welcome. But the results are not as bad as you would think and although far from a rescue job, we do see a small circa 5% gain in its best case scenario in these like for like runs that only this close and accurate test could show. Sadly in play without a frame monitor it still suffers from input latency issues during delivery and as before even if the numbers paint a small gain you would be hard pushed to notice as the frame patient issue is the biggest cause here. So after all is said and done from these tests, and I do hope to have more lined up soon, what conclusions can we draw from our opening gambit? Does it perform better than the old model? Well, the answer is a resounding yes on that score, varying from identical to a fairly decent 10%. So yes, this is the best performing Xbox One you can buy. But the more pertinent question is, should I buy one if I already own an Xbox One? Now check out my review for more on this and my thoughts, but in terms of performance improvements, you would be mad and heavily disappointed indeed if you did buy this on that merit alone.
Microsoft did the right thing here by not marketing the gains, as although under close scrutiny it certainly does deliver gains, they are of such a low level as to be ignored by the majority of players in action. This in no way though makes them unwelcome. As always, I hope you guys and girls enjoyed this. If you did, please hit the like and subscribe button if you did, as it really helps support me. And remember, I am completely independent, unbiased and self-funded. I buy all my hardware and software myself and write my own software, including buying this Xbox One, which is one of the reasons why this is later than I wanted it to be, as I couldn't get hold of one from Microsoft Direct. Are you in the market for an Xbox One? Are you not? Have this video made you think about things? Do you have any questions? Leave them all below. I reply as often as possible. You guys and girls take care and I'll see you on the next one.